a question that I'm often asked is, how do you, how do you make all people care about climate? And you know, and especially when people are asking me that, they're like, how do we make people of color care about the climate crisis? And I'm always like, well, actually, when you look at polling, mm -hmm. people of color actually do care quite a bit about mm -hmm. the climate crisis and want to be mm -hmm. more involved. It's just that we are experiencing so many other social ills mm -hmm. that are also up in our face that climate can feel like this um, thing that we can't describe as a future issue that we'll deal with later. And I think when it comes to um, narratives around climate, it's so important to make connections for people, to make connections between, you know, climate and housing, climates and, uh, you know, uh, unions, climate and food, and those connections are, are there. Mm -hmm. I think we as a movement have to do better and are starting to do better in articulating and describing things more intentionally right. and knowing our audience as well. Right. So to introduce our guest this evening, Wanjiku, or Wawa Gatheru, if I said that correctly. Thank you. Um, she started caring about the environment early in her life. While farming with her mom and grandmother as a child, the conversations would often turn to saving the earth. She's a first-generation American of Kenyan descent who became even more invested in this issue when taking an environmental science class in high school when she learned that social justice and climate issues were deeply intertwined. Everything suddenly became personal and her passion soon turned into activism. Today, Wawa is a climate justice storyteller motivated to uplift the voices of those most adversely impacted by the climate crisis. She's become a prominent voice of her generation using the power of social media to share how communities of color and women have been adversely affected by climate change, as well as the racist roots of the environmental movement. Harnessing her academic background as a Rhodes Scholar and her work as a youth climate activist, Wawa's life goal is to help create a climate movement made in the image of us all. Online, Wawa combats climate nihilism and highlights the legacies of those traditionally sidelined from mainstream environmentalism to our audience of over 80,000 plus across several platforms. She is the founder and executive director of Black Girl Environmentalist, a Public Voices Fellow on the Climate Crisis at Yale University, a recent Revolutionary Power Fellow at the US Department of Energy, where she worked under the first ever Deputy for Energy Justice to integrate energy justice in the federal landscape. Passionate about bringing climate conversations into untraditional spaces, Wawa works collaboratively alongside other creatives, musicians, and culture shapers to bring climate justice to the mainstream. In January of this year, Billie Eilish personally invited Wawa to join her on the first ever digital cover of Vogue alongside seven other climate activists. She sits on boards and advisory councils for the Environmental Media Association, Earth Justice, Climate Power, the National Parks Conversationist Conservation Association, Good, Ener Good Energy, and Sound Future. I'm almost done. Um, she has been recognized as a young futurist by The Root, a Grist 50 fixer, a Glamour College Woman of the Year, and a Victoria's Secret Pink Purpose Project winner. She was also named a climate creator to watch by Peak Action and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and has spoken about her work across the country. And based on this bio and introduction, we already have a ton to learn about and a ton to talk about. Uh, Wawa, welcome to, to the library and our program this evening. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. So I'll get into this a little bit, but I grew up in the quiet corner of Connecticut in a small town called Putnam, and then when I was six, I moved to the town next to it called Pomfret. And growing up, Boston is the largest city, at least the closest one to me. So every summer, my family and I would take days where we explored the city of Boston, and we'd often come to this library. So I'm feeling very, very honored and, and just blessed to be able to be here and, and to share um, my thoughts and ideas with everyone. 
Well, welcome back then, rather than just <laughs> welcome. Um, so, uh, you've started telling us a little bit about yourself, but would you mind telling us a little bit more and how you grew, where you grew up and how you encountered you know, the plight of the planet as, as, your, as your topic for the first, first time. Yeah, so I, I always articulate my connection to environmental issues and the climate crisis as being tied to my climate story. We all have our climate stories and they're essentially the ways in which our, our personal narratives and spheres of influence have connected to mm -hmm. the climate crisis. And for me, I, I believe it happened before I was born. Mm -hmm. So my family is from Kenya. Uh, my parents are both immigrants from Kenya. Mm -hmm. and. According to oral history, both sides of my family have been farmers and stewarding the land for really time immemorial. Mm -hmm. And when my mom immigrated to the United States, um, she tells us stories of how she really found a home in this history where she tended to this overgrown lot in her backyard and mm -hmm. was able to uh, really transformation, transform it into this fertile garden of familiarity. And, Growing up, I found home in, in that act of love. I spent so many of my early years, my elbows deep in the soil, and just watching her as she you know, would tend to the land with a deep love and expertise that was just so wonderful to watch. And uh, having grown up in the quiet corner and being surrounded by wilderness, I spent so much time outside. Um, you know, My parents, I had a very traditional African uh, strict upbringing and I wasn't really one that was engaging with the digital realms before mm. my teens so because we weren't watching a lot of TV we're online we had to spend time outside and I was always very comfortable in those spaces yet even though I had all of those experiences and was very well aware of my history and relationship to the land I actually didn't see myself as an environmentalist mm -hmm. I felt as though environmentalism was this very top shelf issue. Yes, I cared about the polar bears and the melting ice caps, but so much of it felt so far away and so far removed from my community, my family, and myself. And things really shifted when I, when I got to high school, yeah. and I was blessed with a really incredible teacher. Her name was Mrs. Rose. I talk about her all the time. And I stumbled into her environmental science class, and she was just so powerful in the way that she was able to articulate our ecological systems and our planet and, and really showcase that interconnectedness of all of all the things and I began to understand that environmental issues had everything to do with me mm -hmm. and I learned about the environmental justice movement and began mm -hmm. to learn about the legacies of folks like Hazel M. Johnson and Peggy mm -hmm. Shepard and began to really begin to have a fluency in the language of connectivity between our planet and social issues, particularly the climate crisis exacerbating all of these pre-existing social yeah. ills and how if I wanted to be a change maker yeah. at any capacity, to me, that meant joining the climate movement. So it was definitely, it took 15 years for me to get to that point of yeah. saying, I think I want to do this work. And it wasn't until I was actually like a freshman in college that yeah. I outright identified as an environmentalist. It took me some time to get there. Yeah, I think, I think, I mean, part of what we're trying to unpack is what is it that compels people to move from, you know, just being, you know, ostriches in the world, not paying attention to, to understanding where the light bulb goes off and then translating that into action. So it sounds like the, the last two parts for, from your story start in, in high school. Was it like a light bulb going off or was it really more about the digestion of the whole course, if you can think back? Looking back, I always talk about it as being this light bulb moment, yeah. but truly it probably was the light bulb flickering at times yeah. and, and then going off. I think yeah. there were moments of of, of interest, moment of frustration. I spent, I went through every emotion under the sun in that class. Mm. I would experience like, real excitement. I would experience real heartbreak. Yes. I was very, very frustrated that I felt like I was 15 years old and I was suddenly understanding the gravity of the climate crisis right. while also understanding that we weren't talking about it in the way that we needed to with the urgency that is necessary and mm -hmm. what's so interesting is that 
frustration still lies with me today, though it looks different. Um, yeah. But you know, it, it was through working through all of those emotions that I, I, I got to a point of saying I'm not going to be a passive recipient of a future that doesn't take this right. into account. Right. That's not something that I have the privilege to do. So I was very dramatic. One day I got home and I was just so tired of not knowing exactly how I was going to be a part of this movement. I was like, okay, environmental justice, I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to do this work, but I want to dedicate my life to this. So I went to my room, I shut the door, and I got on my knees and I prayed. Mm -hmm. I said, God, um, I'm dedicating my life to environmental justice. Okay. Give me a sign, tell mm -hmm. me if that's the path that I shouldn't go on. Mm -hmm. If not, this is what I'm going to do. Okay. And I didn't hear anything back. So. Okay. I took that's, that as a sign. Uh, that's asking the universe to prove a negative for right. you, but, but, but I like it's it. It's more of a statement than a question, <laughs> yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, did, did that inform your place of where you were going to college or what courses you took? Just to, just to continue that thread into this moment in, in freshman year where it becomes a real yeah, thing. Yeah, surprisingly, no. Right. So interestingly enough, um, that year in high school ended up being my last year of American high school. So I on a whim applied for a fellowship uh, with the U.S. State Department right. called the Kennedy Louvre Youth Exchange and Study Program, long name, yes, yes, On, on a whim, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> on a whim. I had no belief that I would get in. Essentially, it's a program that sends, I believe, like 50 or 60 U.S. students to mm -hmm. countries with high Muslim populations, and mm -hmm. it was created after 9-11 to really um, push forth a mutual understanding mm -hmm. between uh, various communities. And I ended up getting in. I ended up being uh, you know, assigned to Thailand. And I actually didn't tell my parents I applied until like two weeks before I was meant to go. And I was like, I actually need to go to Thailand. Two, two uh, weeks before? <laughs> two weeks before. Okay. Um, and they didn't allow me until three days before I went. So um, it was kind of this experience of being in a totally different life for a year where I had the opportunity to really lean into yeah. that moment that I had of environmental justice is this something I want to do and I spent so much of my free time that year reading more about environmental justice and continuing to be inspired, frustrated and just galvanized. Mm. So when it came to me coming back, mm. I had been bitten by the travel bug. I told my parents I want to move to China, I want to learn all these languages and they were like, "No. We you left for a year, so you're going to go to Yukon, 30 minutes away, and that's that." And at first I was frustrated, of course I would be, um, more so because I, I wasn't given the opportunity to choose where I was going to go. But the more research I did, the more that I realized that there were tons of different um, programs and, and clubs and different things that I could join there that I felt like would provide me not only with an education, but with a, a, a an opportunity to engage with the community of Hartford. Mm -hmm. And so I, I kind of got to college and, and had a, I'm very type eight, like a 16 page document of all I wanted to do mm. when I was at college and just, you know, got started. Yeah. Um, I, I, do, I do think, see if you, if you agree with me, um, that the ability to see other parts of the world um, where um, uh, the, sometimes the effects of uh, climate change um, are more visceral or more real. Uh, can be a moving, a moving factor in, the, in people's understanding of, of how it maybe affects us at home. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, a part of a lot of the frustration that, that I experience and experience to this day in relation to the climate crisis revolves around understanding the climate crisis as a narrative crisis. It's yeah. a crisis of so many different things. It's an ecological crisis. It's a crisis of connectivity. Mm. Um, and it's a leadership crisis. And specifically in articulating that, I was and am still frustrated at the fact that mm -hmm. it is black and brown and mm -hmm. indigenous communities in the US and abroad that are experiencing the brunt of the climate crisis. Yet when we look at, for instance, countries in the so-called global south mm -hmm. that are experiencing the brunt of environmental degradation. They're also the same areas that have, you know, uh, had the least contribution to greenhouse gas emissions that have been for, you know, hundreds of years at this point pillaged and extracted from yeah. and now are, are, are 
quite literally having to beg the global north for loss of damage, for, for climate reparations and things of that sort. And coming from having my family from Kenya and understanding Kenya as a region that is experiencing a lot of the impacts of the climate crisis whilst also not being taken seriously at an international level that has fueled a lot of my frustration and a lot of my direction in my work. Um, and yeah, that, that's, that's a big thing for me. Okay, so um, I, I will come back to those bigger topics in a second, but, but let's stay with your, your, your journey for a moment. So freshman year in college, back at UConn, and that's where you start moving towards a more activist approach. Yeah. What, what, what are the triggers for that? And what do you try first? And what do you, what's the first successful thing that you, you do? Yeah, well, one of the first things I would do is I would take um, the bus um, from, from UConn to Hartford and just sit in on community meetings. It didn't matter what people were talking about. Huh. I just wanted to be there. Huh. Um, I, I started joining a lot of the different climate organizations huh. in, in Hartford and just kind of, you know, being present, mm. um, sitting in the back. Oftentimes, I was almost always the youngest person, sometimes the only person of color, mm. the only black person in those spaces. And, you know, just navigating this interesting dilemma that I found myself in of, oh, this is interesting. I wanted to join this movement because I wanted to help um, create space for, for particularly black folks to yeah. be taken seriously, but also we're not here. And even though Hartford right. is a city that is experiencing a lot of um, racialized difference in regards to economic opportunity, mm -hmm. climate, environmental issues, et cetera, so when I got started in regards to organizing, I, I helped um, co-lead one of, uh, well, actually Connecticut's first Youth Climate Lobby Day alongside a ton of other people mm -hmm. where we were able to bring together um, I believe like a hundred young people from around the state and bus folks to essentially communicate with legislators and tell them, you know, we may not be able to be old enough to vote, but um, you need to take our concerns seriously because we are the generation that have to live with the decisions that are being made at this very, very critical and pivotal point in history that is these 12 years. Uh, I mean, at that point, it was like, you know, 15 years or whatever it was. Um, and, and it was really empowering to be able to be a part of something like that where so many young people were making their voice be heard. And, and I was able to, you know, be a part of tons of different initiatives at UConn specifically mm. around, um, you know, making sure that the youth voice, whether it was a student voice, whether it was a community voice, have access to decision-making tables mm -hmm. and have access to, to folks that were making decisions for us right. and making sure that our concerns were, were being heard and taken seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in some ways, I think the campus environment can be the training ground for activism in, in later life as well as um, life on campus. Um, and I remember my own experiences as well you know, suddenly realize you're not the only one doing something, that there's a whole group around you and you're forming your own community. You're smiling, is that, is that resonating with yes. you? Yes, I, I like to call it a climate squad, I think. Oh. Well, it, that's not even something I came up with. I think um, one of my previous bosses, her name is Dr. Katherine Wilkinson, she always talks about uh, the power of a climate squad and a cohort of folks and friends and comrades that come together and do this work together and it's just more fun that way. Yeah. It also allows you to build the, the strongest argument possible, mm -hmm. bringing in everyone's different expertise and strengths. Um, but yeah, you're exactly right. I think I was really, really lucky um, to be surrounded with the people that I was in undergrad. You know, um, one of the initiatives that I am most proud to have been a part of was this push for UConn to integrate an, an environmental education, general education requirement into the general education um, system. So um, we were able to, over the course of four and a half years, mm. make UConn one of the first, um, or actually the first public university in the country to integrate an environmental literacy general education requirement. And what was so interesting about that is that was a group of not just students, but faculty members and administrators that understood the gravity of having, of making sure that in the, in the journey to make sure that all UConn students are leaving the campus with the tools necessary to be global citizens, that climate and environmentalism is embedded within that because that's just the world we're in, that's the future we're headed towards. And it, it was, 
it was really, really cool to be a part of that. But you know, it took four and a half years, and it, I was lucky to have joined freshman year, so I got to see it, okay. you know, continue to to grow and and really embed itself within within the you and know. This is a curriculum that every student, every yes. undergrad has to take. So and after, this is a module within that required mm -hmm. curriculum. So after fall of 2019, every incoming student has to take uh, one environmental literacy course to graduate. Um, and let, let's move a little forward to um, Black Girl Environmentalist. Yeah. When, when does that start? What, what, um, when does the idea start and when does it become a reality? So um, something that throughout my years of, of being in the climate movement and wearing different hats, whether as a student, whether as an organizer, whether as just a person that is coded as an environmentalist out and about, I would often feel like I was alone as a black girl environmentalist. And so many of my classes, if not all of them, I was the, well, actually, in most of my classes, I was the only person of color, mm. oftentimes the only black person. Mm. In a lot of the explicitly climate organizing spaces I was mm. in, I was almost always the only black person, mm. youngest person in the room, which is so interesting because things are shifting so dramatically just in the past you know, five years alone. Um, I, I, would, I would think, why are, are my people not around? Why are we not being included in these spaces? And there were so many moments where I thought about leaving the climate space, because I was like, maybe this isn't the right avenue for me to support my community. Mm. And what was really interesting was in 2020, when I was sent home from, from undergrad and had to spend, you know, as we all did, right. 10, 10 months before I went off to Oxford, I, I was really struggling with figuring out how to contribute to the movement. I, I was so used to in-person organizing, mm. so I turned to writing. Mm. I started writing a lot of op-eds, mm. and um, I was getting hundreds of messages from black women and black femmes from around the world that were relating to me, mm. and that were saying, this is one of the first time I've seen someone uh, on these public platforms talking about this unique experiences that we have as youth activists, as, as, as students in environmental disciplines, and really articulate um, the frustration that and the intellectual exhaustion that often comes with having to convince people in our in the spaces that we occupy why it's important for us to be taken seriously why it's important to engage with black and indigenous scholars in our coursework why it's important for environmental justice to not be an add-on subject but to be something that is taken seriously and I had this light bulb moment of, oh my goodness, if people are really craving a community of folks that they can relate to, why don't we do something about that? So I put up a, a call on Instagram. I was like, calling all black girl environmentalists. Mm. Here's a Zoom link and we're gonna meet next week. Mm. And next week came and over 100 people showed up to a Zoom call from all over the world. And I was just, absolutely astounded and inspired and I was like, okay, we're going to make this an organization and we're yeah. going to have a lot of fun with this. Wow. Um, so in, in some ways you took advantage of that year of COVID where everybody was working remotely, living remotely, living alone and doing this work in order to connect with others via social media. Exactly. Um, um, okay. So Let's, let's go back to some of the, um, the identity pieces to, to this equation um, that we're, we're unpacking. So, um, black, girl, environmentalist. Yes. Three pieces. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think you know, there's, there's a greater understanding today that we all bring an intersectional sense of ourselves mm -hmm. to, to, our, to, our, to what, where we're present. Um, in, in terms of the work, was one part coming first? Was it a sense of the whole? I, I, I'd just like to hear you think about, uh, talk with us about, about that. Yeah, I think it definitely came about as a whole. Okay. It's like a package, you know. Right. Black girls that are interested in the environment, that love the planet, yeah. that are in this space, are interested in the space, um, and also, you know, black femmes and black non-binary yeah. folks as well, all of us that are, you know, in this work and, and, and want to also have spaces of, that cultivate joy and optimism yeah. and a space that can also be very heartbreaking. Um, and I also want to specify on, you know, for instance, like why women, why black women? Mm -hmm. So we know that women are a frontline um, demographic when it comes to the climate crisis and impacts relating to environmental degradation. 
Why? Because um, women's rights continue to be infringed upon at varying degrees around the world and enforced um, gender inequality really impacts um, our, our voice, our opportunity, our economic and political mobility around the world. And when we are looking at, you know, black and brown women in particular, we understand that the historic and continuing impacts of systemic racism and colonialism and imperialism really um, distinguish us as a frontline community. However, there is this really interesting dichotomy that happens where it's like we're not we're not just passive victims of this mm -hmm. so many of the most compelling leaders mm -hmm. in climate are black and brown women or matriarchs that have mm -hmm. have been doing this for mm -hmm. so long as a means of survival mm -hmm. so a, a lot of black girl environmentalist is also shifting the narrative mm -hmm. of who environmentalism is for, who has actively been a part of stewarding the land, and really shining a light on the long history of, you know, black matriarchs that have, uh, you know, contributed so much to the space, but largely go unrecognized, mm -hmm. under-resourced, under-supported, and who we all have so much to learn from mm -hmm. in regards to really, you know, cultivating solutions that are as robust as, as we need. I want to try and make this as explicit as possible so that everybody gets what, what, the, what the point is. So are you saying that in, in different parts of the world, it, it's the women who are often the main workers on farms or head mm -hmm. of households in reality um, or doing other kinds of work? And so if something changes in the environment, they're the ones that are seeing it first? Oh, certainly. I mean, there's there's tons of studies on this, yeah. right? When you see women in in parliament, for instance, mm -hmm. we see better, um, we see more robust climate policies come through. We actually see less carbon emissions overall in those in those countries. When we have um, women uh, placed in leadership in regards to mm -hmm. natural resource. Um, stewardship, we see better conservation outcomes. So right. time and time again, we right. see that there are benefits right. of having us um, in positions of power. Right. So it's, it's, it's this thing that we really need to push forward more. Right. Which, which is a relatively new global phenomenon. Of, of women, of women in, in these positions. Of yeah. power. I mean, for obvious reasons, right? So um, now the other dimension to this is that as your experience of working in the early years, like in your early years of climate movement, um, you're seeing, you know, the effects of systemic racism within the movement itself. Yes. You, you're, you're one of a couple early on in some of the meetings that you just described. Um, for sure, for sure. And, I, and it's so interesting because for a long time, I, I wasn't really understanding the root of the disconnect that I was experiencing in the classroom and in movement spaces. And then, you know, the more research I did, the more I began to uncover the racist roots of the environmental mm. movement and understanding that, you know, the literal fathers of the American environmental movement and understanding the American environmental movement as having informed the conservation movements mm -hmm. from a global perspective and really inform the creation of, of them elsewhere were, you know, founded by, you know, folks like John Muir and Madison Grant, folks that really conceptualize racialized um, ideas around conservation and, and preservation and, and quite literally were connecting, um, keeping certain spaces and, and, and preserving them for the continuation of specifically the white race and excluding uh, undesirables. And learning that history kind of was like, oh, okay, then there's, yeah. there's a reason why these dynamics are, are, are the way that they so, are. So it's like we get the, like we as a society, we get the value of conserving and preserving, at least in theory, in practice is a whole other matter. We get that early on, but it's really still about preserving the power structures and the power dynamics that exist in society until the movement starts to be much more inclusive. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so this was uh, college year, the, the group is started, um, and then you go to Oxford. Um, yeah. Tell us about that. I mean, Oxford is a very interesting experience also because, um, you know, there was just so much anxiety around it. I mean, we all, we all know what that felt like of, of not really knowing what was going to happen. Um, I don't think I've ever 
been that anxious in my life of just like kind of not knowing what was going to happen. Because this is year two of the pandemic, and you're mm-hmm. you're going you're going away, you're going to a college physically, right. and you're traveling internationally, and all that goes with that at that time. Right. So um, you know we weren't totally sure if it was going to be virtual in person, and it was kind of flip flopping. And we saw Cambridge decided to go virtual, and we're like, I guess we're virtual. And then Oxford was actually like, come in person. Right. Um, so so I flew out and. Um, I had my 14 days of isolation, and on day seven of being out, the country went into lockdown again. So I spent the first term, Mikkelmas term, basically being very isolated in my in my room, and you know we all we all understand that, and um, going on walks and meeting you know other road scholars and, and classmates on you know little walks that we do around town. Mm. And what was interesting about that is I went home for Christmas because I was very homesick and just deprived of human connection mm. and got locked out of the country. Uh. Actually, so this is the, the time where the flights, you couldn't go back and forth. So wow. I spent Hillary term actually in the US okay. doing okay. coursework virtually and then returned back for Trinity. And it was really interesting because at this point I was also um, juggling starting a new organization and most of my all of my teammates at that point were all based in Canada and the US so I was you know waking up really early or really late and trying to navigate all that stuff while managing a coursework in a new country and yeah it was just a lot going on (laughs) at that at that time Mm. Um, but it, again, the opportunity is to continue building a global virtual organization right. because of the craziness that we were all living with. Um, and it was honestly looking back, um, those two years are very rewarding as well because I, especially as you know, I got to spend more time outside, I got really close with a lot of folks in the UK climate movement and the youth climate movement uh, particularly. And um, like you said, in regards to uh, stewarding a a global community, having a community in the UK and then back in the US, it was really, really incredible to, you know, plant those seeds and and to be able to now have a BG hub in development for the UK Mm. to where we're able to, for instance, BG helped um, alongside uh, several other organizations. We led the first ever black eco Feminist Summit in the UK um, this past October, and it was just amazing convening of of of, of, of black women and, and and black friends coming together in the name of loving the planet and wanting to be around other folks that were grounded in that as well. So, um, you shared with us a little bit about the story of how you got to go to Thailand, and you know that this was on a whim applying to the yeah. the scholarship program. Um, can you tell us about how does the Rhodes Scholarship work? What is it? Yeah. And, and do you get nominated? Do you apply? Is it random selection? Um, oh, I we, wish it I was random we, selection. I think we'd love to celebrate, celebrate this with you um, as an example of some of the, uh, the accolades that you've got. Yeah. Um, so first, I don't think... I think you'd be crazy to like apply for the Rhodes Scholarship or whatever it is and expect to win. Mm-hmm. Um, to be honest, at that point, um, I had received the Truman and the Udall scholarships, which are um, scholarships meant to surface young emerging talent in the spheres of public service and environmental leadership. And in both of those applications, I learned so much about myself, just filling them out, in which I had to like reflect on who I was, why I did what I do, and what I wanted to do, and uh, had to like be very specific in that application. So I applied specifically so that I could have a better understanding of myself for Rhodes, and um, somehow was called in for for um, as a finalist, and and, and somehow won. And um, you know. The Rhodes Scholarship is essentially a, an opportunity for f- young people around the world to get a free education at mm. Oxford for two or more years. Yeah. So for me, that made graduate school a possibility. If that wasn't, uh, if that hadn't happened, I was planning on working for, you know, two to five years because I could not afford going to grad school. So it was a, this huge door opener for me and opened so many doors um, in that regard for sure. And what did you do, read at Oxford when you were there? <laughs> <laughs> I read an MSc in Nature Society and Environmental Governance. Great. Um, there, there's a dimension to our conversation that um, I, I think you know, is trying to celebrate and get at the fact that 
the younger generation, your generation, the, the, whether it's Gen Z, millennials, um, this new uh, generation alpha, alpha, maybe we're calling yeah. it, that's coming up next, that there's a both an expect, there's a downside and a positive to this, right? There's a, an expectation that you all are stronger than maybe my generation was to move this ball forward. I think we want to celebrate that, but at the same time, we are still all in this together. Yes. Uh, so would you, would you help me uh, with that a little bit, that narrative? And, and yeah. How, how do we both celebrate these new voices and new activism, but at the same time, don't say, oh, great, you got it, so we're, we're good. You know, um, this, always, this is always something I think about because Yes, I'm, I'm a very proud uh, member of Gen Z, and I think it's so interesting every time there's a new think piece talking about Gen Z in the workplace and how we won't <laughs> you know, take disrespect or whatever it might be. Um, and, I, and I think there's, there's a lot that our generation is bringing to the table, but to be honest, I feel like we as a society like experience so much historic amnesia, like young people have led every social movement. But and we did this with Gen X and Gen <laughs> right. Y as well, so. Uh. So when you, when you, you know, if you, if you ask me or you ask any other you know, youth yeah. climate activists um, why we got into this work, there's always a connection to an elder. Mm. There's always a connection to older people in our lives that have taken us under their wings, kin or not. Mm -hmm. um, and have essentially shown us the ways of organizing, shown us the ways of, 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 of working within the system or wh whatever, whatever theory of change it might be. And so it's very interesting that there is this thing, it's a narrative thing within the climate space of it's like Gen Z versus baby boomers and Gen Z's pointing, you know, the okay boomer, mm. you know, thing of, Trope, right. you know, us telling older folks that you, you let us here. And this again lends itself to the narrative crisis that we're in, right? When we talk about fighting the climate crisis, it's like we're fighting this, this enemy that we don't know what it looks like, we don't know where it comes from, but we're just kind of fighting at the mm. air. And, you know, when it comes to articulating how we got to this place in the first place, we, we need to understand that it's not, you know, a random older person or, or, or baby boomer that led us here. You know, when, when I think about my grandparents, they didn't know what the climate crisis was. Um, and, and when they passed, I, I'm sure they still didn't. You know, they were just trying to survive, right. you know? So it would be inaccurate for me to say that, you know, it was baby boomers as a generation. Yeah. There were members of the baby boomer, you mm -hmm. know, demographic that certainly knew about the climate crisis that were a part of, you yeah. know, the creation or, you know, in, in the industries of the fossil fuel industry mm -hmm. that have, you know, unfortunately placed profit over people time and time sure. again. But those are specific corporations and specific individuals. It's not fair to point to entire generations. And, you know, we talked briefly about, um, or before this, we talked briefly about hope and the way that it seems mm -hmm. like every time uh, a young person does something you know, exceptional or other people see as exceptional, it's like, you give me so much hope. And mm -hmm. I always cringe at that. I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm happy you feel inspired. Right. Um, but my hope isn't for you to borrow. Yeah. Hope is a discipline. It's something yeah. that you earn. Yeah through action, yeah. and when you're able to cultivate your own hope, when you're able to engage with the cultivation of hope as a discipline, mm -hmm. what you receive is so much better than borrowing it from anybody. Hmm. Um, thank you for, for that. I mean, I do, I do think we can celebrate, um, in one of the earlier conversations with, um, uh, with Gina McCarthy, we were talking about her earlier work and that the focus was very much on combating pollution, and environmental degradation. Um, it's the same work. The focus was just at a different point, or maybe the, the fuller understanding wasn't, uh, wasn't available at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and she, too, um, uh, believes herself to be a person of hope and, uh, in, in the work and, and in life. So uh, I love the fact that you, both of our guests share that perspective in some ways. Um, from different generations. Um, I wonder if it's the social media dimension and mm -hmm. the, inter the sense of interconnectedness that puts this on a whole different plane, um, that uh, it's really over the last five to 10 years that these media platforms um, have become both democratized, 
there's a good and a bad side to that, uh, but certainly everybody can um, find a voice, find their voice, uh, find the right community, and if it resonates, it can take off, just as it has for you. So it does seem like your story, um, Greta Gunberg's story, for example, um, um, David Hogg's story, more on the gun violence issue and gun control issues, um, all speak to how this generation and others living at this moment can take advantage of this in ways that were not possible before. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, I started making content online around climate and climate misinformation and climate nihilism um, two years ago, and I never ever saw myself doing that. Um, you know, I've always grown up with my parents are like, be private, don't put too much out online, don't yeah. place, and I've always kind of been, been hesitant also just because I'm a perfectionist and I've always been like, if I don't like what I say, then I can't take it back and all that. Yeah. Um, but the reason why I decided to, to make content and specifically make content on TikTok is I learned that TikTok had surpassed Google as the number one search engine yep. in the world. And when we look at the age breakdown yep. of and, and distribution of those searches, mm. it's obviously skewed. Yep. Um, you see Gen Z and millennials and even Gen Alpha. Gen Alpha, the oldest of Gen Alpha is 13, it's crazy. Yep. Um, and, and, and they're turning to TikTok to educate themselves. Mm. And yet, if you type in climate change or the climate crisis, I mean, after this, I you know, all of you do that. It's ton, it's filled with climate misinformation. Mm. There's no fact checking, um, there's no fact checking on the app and people um, are essentially spreading so much climate misinformation in the name of winning over the algorithm, being clickbaitable mm. and, and, and basically just fearing people into watching their full mm. videos. Yeah. So I felt compelled to make content mm -hmm. because I wanted to add climate truth so this is and a also fight climate fire with fire approach yeah uh, for okay. sure and there has been this really really interesting crop of climate creators um, that that have started and, and have kind of taken TikTok, for instance, by storm, yeah. by creating content that is like stitching climate misinformation and saying, actually, the study didn't say this. If you actually took time to read through it, mm. you'd actually see this, this, and mm. this. Or, you know, something that constantly is trending online is this idea of climate doomerism, which is the idea that we have reached this point of no return mm. in regards to the climate crisis, that action at this point is pointless, so, so why care? Mm. And that couldn't be further from the truth. And so many of us are actually, you know, making videos and saying, actually, this is the most pivotal time in history. Mm. We're literally in the crucial mm. decade for us not to step away, not to fall into apathy, but to, to lean into the possibilities mm. of, 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 of a world that we haven't even seen before in history. Mm. And that's really exciting. Mm. So I think the tactic of fearing people into action isn't one that's super effective, mm. at least from getting the strongest and largest team possible. So showcasing to people the climate solutions that are happening that don't get a lot of airtime, mm -hmm. you know, um, addressing climate misinformation, and then introducing to people yeah. all the amazing yeah. climate work that is happening that people are committing to, and and really just you know getting lost in in all the beautiful possibilities that that come with having a radical imagination, radical imagination when it yeah. comes to uh, world building and, and, and just climate yeah. features. So, so I, I heard you say that the three things you're combating in part of this work, and I think it's in some of your other speeches as well, misinformation, disinformation, and nihilism. Would you mind quickly take us through why each of those is its own disease? Oh, well, <laughs> um, well, climate nihilism, we, we, none of us have the privilege to be able to say it's too late. Right. One, it's factually incorrect. We're actually not at a point of no return, like yep. I said before, um, but also because, you know, if you take that stance, then what then are you endorsing? If you're not experiencing mm. the climate crisis right now, then what about the land defenders in Brazil, mm. in, in the Philippines, that are losing their lives over protecting people and planet as a means of survival? What are you saying to folks that are experiencing wildfires right now? And also, mm. even if you're not experiencing those dynamics right now, who's to say that you won't in the near future? Who's to say that people close to you aren't? And then in the midst of that, how would you feel about people saying that we should give up? Mm. Um, in regards to climate misinformation, I mean, it's just, 
it's just wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, right. providing people. That's, that's the easiest you, one yeah. on the list, by the way, I think, right? And same with the other one. Yeah, it's just yeah, wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, misinformation, we, we think of as being, you know, some, some, you just got the facts wrong. Disinformation is deliberately misleading other people right. um, for some other purpose or some other mm -hmm. end, right? So, um, but it sounds like the answer, based upon your, your recipe, is demonstrate where the actions are positive, mm -hmm. um, articulate solutions, and bring joy and imagination to the fight. Yes. That's what I heard, exactly. right? Exactly. Great. Um, I know before we take some questions, um, you had a couple of pictures that you had uh, sent us. I don't know if we want to um, have, have you talk oh, about okay. one or two of those scenarios because it, uh, it shows you at work, as it were, oh, or yeah. in, in context. Um, oh, yeah. This is a really special day. Um, so I received accommodation from um, the U.S. Um, are from the Connecticut State Senate and the House of Representatives. And those are my parents and my little sister. And we got this really cool tour of the Connecticut yeah. State House and got to meet the mayor and was, uh, met, meet the governor. And it was really, really special to share that moment with my family. Yeah. Ah, this is from the Environmental Media Association Impact Summit last year. And this was a panel on, um, I believe, ah, climate storytelling, ethical climate storytelling. And these are some of my incredible friends. You should look them up if you don't know them already. Um, Maya Penn, Isaiah Hernandez, and Christy Drutman, who are all incredible um, creators and, and environmentalists that are doing really incredible work. Isaiah will actually be with us in June for, um, for our fifth bonus program, yes. in, in, not quite in this series, but it's a connected topic for sure. This is from the day previously. Yeah. Um, and. I was like, oh my goodness. Ah. So ethic, ethical climate storytelling, yeah. what, what, what might that be? Yeah, so we were discussing um, how, particularly the way that climate storytelling is, is showing up in the entertainment space okay. and specifically discussing how there are many instances in which frontline communities and black and brown folks and frontline folks in general are not are often subjects of these films and documentaries or, or content and not always provided access to be able to tell our own stories mm -hmm. and discussing pathways of how we could really disrupt that paradigm. Okay. Great. And I don't know is there one more or are we good? One more. Oh, this is from the Black Ecofeminist um, Summit back in October, and there's just so many incredible people. Um, I will point out, because this is one of my resources, um, my friend Michaela Loach in the pink, she recently um, published her first book. It's called It's Not That Radical, um, Climate Solutions to Transform Our World. I think that's what the abbreviation is, um, but it's, it's not that radical, and it's an incredible book and a resource for folks that are interested in, you know, understanding climate solutions as a way to transform our world to be better and to love a better world into existence. So, and everyone there is incredible. I'm just, you know, gonna. Okay. Um, we're gonna start taking some questions from uh, the audience here and in, in, uh, in from our online audience. Because we want everybody to be able to participate, I just have a, have a moment to think about the question you want to ask. Raise your hand and Andrew will bring a microphone to you. Um, and Kristen will be paying attention to the online um, uh, participants for uh, questions from there. there. There's one over here on, on the left and I have the, a couple from the registration I will ask interveningly as well. So please go ahead. Uh, hi, thank you hi. so much for this. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, kind of expand upon what you said earlier about cult the practice of cultivating hope. Um, I also work in the climate space and I find that to be, as, as an attorney, and I find that like the hardest part of the job. <laughs> um, and so like, like specifically, how do you do it? Yeah, so you said cultivate hope. I didn't hear the first word. What was it? Um, how to cultivate hope. Oh, okay. Yeah. How to cultivate hope. Um, I think there's so many different ways. I think you're likely already doing it. Um, I think, here's the thing. Um, in the context of, of bringing that up, I think um, in those instances of people barring hope, I always say you know, hope is a discipline and, and, the, and the ways that we 
cultivate that and, and build up our own hope is honestly doing the work, is, is putting ourselves into circumstances to where we're able to be um, change makers in our own right, to have the privilege of having a climate community, climate comrades. I think, I always think about how lucky I am to have a community of other people that understand the gravity of the circumstances we find ourselves in and that are actively, you know, seeding their communities with, with solutions. And my worldview, and maybe yours as well, has been informed by this to where my understanding of the world is that I have friends around the world that are doing incredible work. So when I think about the future, I think about all their projects and initiatives growing and scaling and, and being able to inform so many more things. And I really think it, it, it begins with just doing the work and, and, you're, and you're doing that already. Well, I'll take one of my earlier questions from registration. Um, and this asks you to, um, you know, going back to your, your own um, high school experience, uh, when, when the, those light bulbs were going off. The question is, what do you wish your middle or high school science teachers would have said outside of the one that, that where the light bulbs did go off? What, what could they have said or done in class that would encourage more leaders like you to make an impact? So I think this is trying to get at what, what can teachers do today to, to really um, help more of those light bulbs go off? You know, I, I don't want to point that, I don't know if I had said this earlier, but I watched An Inconvenient Truth when I was five years old. My art teacher had us watch it, and I went home and I was like traumatized. Um, so if we imagine I was shown that film a little older, um, I, I think something that would have also been helpful is having a conversation of why that film connects to our lives yeah. and how there are also people yeah. in the Arctic, right? right. Um, and, and understanding the connections between the health of the planet and the health of people and how mm. when we bring those two together, yeah. we understand that there's so much to fight for and that there is connections between issues that feel out there because right. there's one planet, there's one home. And I think those themes are, are very digestible to young yeah. people. We understand the gravity of that. I mean, that was, that was Al Gore's 2006 um, film, documentary film. Um, and, you know, I think those that were paying attention went, oh my God, look at how bad this is or how, how it could be. But then it ultimately did not connect. It did not turn into a global movement right at that, at that moment. Do you, do you have a sense of now looking back why that would be the case and what changed later? I will be so honest and say I haven't seen that film in like 10 years at this point. Um, but in, in, in what I remember, um, I'd say, yeah, the, the, the human element as well. I think a question that I'm often asked is how do you, how do you make all people care about climate? And, you know, and especially when people are asking me that, they're like, how do we make people of color care about the climate crisis? And I'm always like, well, actually, when you look at polling, mm -hmm. people of color actually do care quite a bit mm -hmm. about the climate crisis and want to be mm -hmm. more involved. It's just that we are experiencing so many other social ills mm -hmm. that are also up in our face that climate can feel like this. Um, thing that we can't describe as a future issue that we'll deal with later. And I think when it comes to um, narratives around climate, it's so important to make connections for people, mm -hmm. to make connections between, you know, climate and housing, climate and, uh, you know, uh, unions, climate and food, mm -hmm. and those connections are, are there. Mm -hmm. I think we as a movement have to do better and are starting to do better in articulating and describing things more intentionally right. and knowing our audience as well. Right. I mean, one of the examples that resonated for me from our backyard here in Boston was learning that for one particular community that's you know, more urban, more economically challenged in terms of the demographics, um, and, you know, because of the density experiences, the highest rise in heat at the height of the summer also has the least amount of 
um, trees yes. or, or so that that connects those dots for me very very well and I think if our narratives did more of that then we'd be, we'd be able to um, make this real in a way where perhaps Inconvenient Truth had all of the facts right, but right. didn't make it as relatable uh, from a storyteller's point of view as it could be. Absolutely, and I, and I love that example that you, you brought up, and I actually use it quite a bit when we think about you know, communities that were previously redlined. Those are the same communities that are experiencing the worst um, impacts of extreme heat right. and also the least amount of tree canopy mm -hmm. cover and you know, making the connections, for instance, of how that has implications for the black maternal health crisis right. as you know, extreme heat impacts um, the, the, the health of, of, of mothers and, and babies and how it's just another risk factor in this um, cacophony of, of, of different issues that are informing those, those type of health impacts. Great. Another question here in person? or online? Okay, not yet. Um, the second question I had from registration, um, which, um, well, you, you talked about praying at one point in your, in your own journey. Um, and this question asks, what's a good way to engage the black religious community in environmental justice issues? That's a really good question. So I'll first say I identify as agnostic. Okay. Um, I'm a deeply spiritual person, um, though I grew up in uh, an evangelical Christian home, mm -hmm. uh, which has informed a, a lot of my understanding of these issues as well. But I would say at its basis, um, I believe that a lot of the, the tendons across different religion mm -hmm. are, are grounded in, in stewarding our, our, our world of, mm -hmm. of loving each mm -hmm. other. And I, I would argue that when it comes to an ethic of, of care around solving the climate crisis, around being engaged citizens in climate action, mm -hmm. serving our communities means serving our communities at the issues that are experienced, that folks are experiencing first and worst. And I think when it comes to loving thy neighbor, um, folks in our communities, particularly the black community, are experiencing environmental injustices and, and we have to come together to really uh, resource each other um, and, 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 and do whatever we can to support folks. Yeah, from my limited knowledge, the, um, the black churches, particularly in this area, have always been at the forefront of the civil rights movement more broadly. So it would seem, I don't know if you would agree, it would seem to an outsider's viewpoint that extending that to climate justice issues is a very, very small step. Certainly, and you know, the environmental justice movement, um, so many of the, the, the mothers and fathers of the movement came from the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. That genealogy is, is right there. You think of uh, Dr. King and, and the fact that he himself was an environmental justice leader, mm -hmm. talking right. about um, sanitation conditions in, in, in Memphis and, and it really beginning to mm -hmm. describe the very language that is EJ. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's so interesting and there's a connection that folks don't always make around Fridays for Future and the Children's Crusade from 1963 mm -hmm. is the fact that, you know, in 2018 and 2019, the world you know, watched in awe as young people, you know, decided to walk out of their classrooms right. to fight for a better future. And this kind of leans into the historic amnesia. It's like, that was not the first time young people have walked out of their schools to fight for a better future. Mm -hmm. Black children in Birmingham, Alabama mm -hmm. in 1963 did the very mm -hmm. same exact thing. And that's where those threads are, are there. And they're also exciting because that shows us that we actually don't have to reinvent the wheel now. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary Annalise Hegler talks about this so much um, in regards to the climate crisis is our greatest existential threat, but it's not our first. People have had to fight for their lives before, mm -hmm. and there's so much that we can learn from the words and narratives that have been left behind for us by folks from the civil rights movement, by folks from other social movements that had to um, carve mm -hmm. their, 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 their futures mm -hmm. um, out of seemingly nothing, mm -hmm. but we're still able to do so. Mm -hmm. And obviously, because we're in a library, I love the fact that you are threading themes of history to inform um, the current moment. So it's not just about what's happening right now, but it is it is part of a a tradition that we can simply take the next next steps on. So uh, we have oh we have great we have one question here, one question here, and one question here. You just needed to warm up, right? Go ahead. Um, hi, thank you for being here. Um, so I study urban planning 
and we talk about climate change, you know, urban heat islands, uh, air pollution, things like that. Then we also talk about the housing crisis. And so, you know, there's a few solutions for fighting climate change, planting trees, um, you know, uh, lost words, hydration stations, things like that. Um, and there's even fewer solutions, successful solutions for intervening in people experiencing homelessness. And so are there any success stories for interventions that tackle both of those issues? That's a great question. Uh, successful, off the top of my head, I, I'm not totally sure about a exact situation. Um, yeah, off the top of my head, but I'm sure they're there. I mean, the concept of housing justice as an environmental justice is environmental justice issue is so clear. Um, and I know that there are so many folks that are also working on the issue of green gentrification, of understanding that many of the very same environmental justice communities that have won on, on, on EJ in their communities are also um, many times being bought out, where developers are now seeing undesirable land and as being desirable now that it's been cleaned up, it is now more livable. And that is a fight that is an environmental justice one. And um, yeah, that's, that's the most I could say on that. I mean, some of, some of the causes of the homelessness um, symptoms that we're currently experiencing come from displacing people out of their homes, mm -hmm. which is a function of an unjust society in part. Um, or it's about whole, uh, you know, groups of people being displaced because it's no longer a livable condition if it's in, in other parts of the world, which adds to the, the immigration and migration challenges that we're seeing too. So, uh, you know, I, I, I know you didn't want to hear what I had to say, but, um, but I see these as, as being very, very interconnected. And the more we uplift the interconnectedness, right. the better a shot we have of actually moving more towards action. Mm -hmm. We have another question over here. Hi, thanks for coming to Boston. Um, do, you, do you personally believe that um, we can only heal the planet and fix the climate crisis by, with a complete social revolution and replacing capitalism? Mm -hmm. And what do you tell people who might be afraid of that eventuality, who are benefiting under the current system, even if they're not captains in, of industry? Maybe they're just you know, middle-class folks. Yeah, so to answer your first question, yes. Um, <laughs> you know, I think I'm always an advocate for taking time to, for us to be upfront with their theories of change around what it is we're working towards. I think because there's so much urgency around this issue, we take for granted that. And, and some, there are some people whose theories of change is to just rely on carbon capture and just like slap green on, on everything and not get to the root issue and really dismantle and abolish the systems that have led us here. And for me, that's just, we, we can't do that. We, we really do need mass societal transformation. To answer second of what I would tell people is, you know, there, one is, I understand, you know, change is scary. I think people, um, yeah, people are afraid of change. Also because what we're saying the, the range of all the different possibilities is so vast. And I think because it's so vast, it can be scary. But what I would tell people is actually, there's so much to lean into there. There is this, I always articulate this way. I think that Mother Earth is giving us really important feedback and that we have this once in a species long opportunity to reprioritize and restructure our world, to be able to live in a present and future that is better than any other past than we've ever experienced. And I think that's enticing. If we can tell people that this movement has the ability to connect with every social issue that we feel close to and, and really allow people to live a life beyond survival, and, and, and allow for children to not have to be on the streets being children activists or and just be children and babies. That is exciting, that's enticing. And I think when we are able to make those connections and really appeal to people on the level of protecting their families and people that they love, that's when I, I usually see people go, huh, okay, what, 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 is that, what does that look like? And that's where it gets really, really exciting and that's where the radical imagination comes in. 
You, you had a phrase in the Bryant University speech that you gave called rehearse revolution. Yes. Uh, could you connect that to the last question oh, as well? Oh, um, absolutely. So there was this book that I read in undergrad, and yeah, the name is filling me right now, but the book was uh, making the argument that you know, in between the world wars, we had um, colleges funded by unions that were essentially providing an adult education whilst also indoctrinating, uh, you know, students into the cause using left-leaning drama programs. And that was a way of giving people the opportunity to rehearse revolution quite literally in the form of drama. And it, it, it's something that I, I find so fascinating because you know, that is an instance in history that we can lean on and say, oh, that, that's very interesting because the book basically argues that those um, training grounds actually led to a lot of the transformational um, early social activism of the early 20th century. And if we take that, that, that concept and, and use it in our lives and practice revolution, it it allows us to be able to begin to cultivate the world we're building towards. And that's where, you know, hope, where, where you were basically asking of how can we cultivate hope? And I said, doing the work. Because when we do the work, we're able to look around and smell and taste the, the, the groundwork of the world we're building. And that's where it's really exciting. Whenever I have a BGE event and I look around and I see black women and black femmes just existing and engaging in joy and just you know being carefree, I'm like, this is, this is what I wanna see more of. This is the future I wanna build. And that's where it's really exciting to me. So that's where the rehearsing revolution mm -hmm. aspect came from. Thank you. A question over here. Um. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today. This has been incredible. Um, and I really like the point you had made earlier about misinformation and about the narrative crisis and just sort of how it distracts from some of the real and select few perpetrators of climate injustice. Um, and I'd just love to hear a little bit more about addressing that. Like, does that need to be a name and shame game? Like, who needs to step up to sort of like draw those connections um, for people to be able to understand? Yeah, I love that question. Also, do we know each other? Yes, we've met a couple I years know. ago. Yeah. I was like, I wait. <laughs> I think we are roommates. A little, yes. A couple okay, years we'll ago. Okay, we'll have yes. to talk. We <laughs> will, we will, we will. Libraries bring people okay. together, I don't know. <laughs> um, sorry, I was like looking at your face the whole time. Can you ask that one more time? I was just like, I know you from somewhere. <laughs> Uh, no, just sort of um, more about your take on addressing the narrative crisis and sort yeah. of like this idea that, uh, what you said sort of earlier too, I just like really loved about, um, we have this like general blame for the boomers, but then when you really think about it, it's these like select few actors and just sort of like really like painting that picture for people of like what we should do. Yeah, I love that question. Um, you know, there's so much, I use the word we as a unifier most of the time, but there is this pervasive, narrative thing in, in climate where we say we are the virus, humans are the virus, and we did this. And it's actually like, no, we didn't. We didn't. Mm. Um, we, can, we can literally point to the fossil fuel industry, and we can specifically point to governments that have subsidized them. And we can point to you know, CEOs and folks that have, you know, for instance, you know, Shell knew about the impacts of, 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 of their of their work from as early as the 1950s and continue to, to not only accelerate what they were doing, but actually lead uh, some of the earliest climate science so that they could debunk other climate science so that people didn't know what was going on. So I would say introducing people to that history and also connecting the genealogy of the climate crisis beyond the Industrial Revolution. So oftentimes we talk about the Industrial Revolution as being the father of the climate crisis in regards to jump-starting the rapid increase of greenhouse gas emissions and, 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 and CO2 and, and things of that sort. But the Industrial Revolution didn't come out of nowhere. It didn't pay for itself. It was quite literally paid for by chattel slavery by blood money, right? We can literally see a money trail between um, the most uh, wealthy plantations and the Industrial Revolution, and thus the creation of the fossil fuel industry. So telling people about that history and saying, actually, there are folks that we can hold accountable today that have benefited from these circumstances and also understand that while we didn't create this issue, 
we have, uh, to me, have a responsibility to be a part of the solutions together. And, you know, in, in, in doing so, I think it also relieves us of a lot of guilt, because I think a lot of guilt that we have around, I'm not doing enough, or I don't know enough, is around not articulating who it is that brought us here. And I think that gives us a lot of grace in, in being able to really understand how we got here. Thank you. Um, Kristen? Oh, good. okay. Thank you so much for coming here. Uh, sorry if it's a long-winded answer. I'm trying to formulate and listen at the same time. But I, I guess my question is, you know, what advice do you have for people? Because I'm in the academia world, and I feel like everyone's like, you got to get a PhD first. You got to go get a higher education first before you can. People are going to listen to your voice. So what are what is some advice you have for people who want to start now? It feels urgent. We want to get involved, but don't have this higher education or are not an expert at all these things yet. Yeah, I mean, I'm honestly there with you. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll out myself. Before I was collected to come here, I was actually looking at PhD programs on my phone. And I was like, <laughs> that's a topic for another day. Um, but I would say my hesitancy about, or why I've shifted my trajectory that I have never shared with anyone, but things I wanted to do was because of the urgency. Because, you know, as great as my experience at Oxford was, I often felt guilty for being in the UK and having this gift of time to just think and ponder and, and write while my community is experiencing environmental racism and environmental injustice and coming back and instead of applying to further programs and deciding that I wanted to feed into my community more, I think you don't need a higher degree. You don't need um, to, you don't need these institutions or traditional institutions of power to validate you for your work to be valid. And, um, you know, what I would say specifically advice, there is this really powerful tool that I've been telling everyone about and that I use often and it's called the Climate Venn Diagram. It was created by um, Dr. Ayana Johnson and basically, you know, like a Venn diagram, three circles. In one circle, you have the things that bring you joy, the things that get you up in the morning, the things that make you happy. And then another circle, you have the things that um, the, the things that you are especially talented in, the skills that you bring to the table. It's like if you asked a friend or someone close to you, what is it that you would bring to a group project? It's those things. And then the last circle, it's the work that needs doing within your unique sphere of influence. And when you write down all those things, in the middle, you're going to see the constellation of possibilities of where you could start. So I'd say spend more time thinking about where, where your mode of action is rather than waiting for some institution to validate you because you don't need that. Um, we're just after 7.15, so we'll start to bring things to a close unless there's one more, one more question to take either from online or in person. Yes, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take... <laughs> Your last question, and then I have a, a closing comment. Hi, Wawa. Hey. Nice to see you. Um, I I have like kind of like a two-part question. Um, so you know, like my undergrad training is also in EJ, um, but I, when I was living in China for two years during the pandemic, an issue that I ran into was kind of like how the justice framework is not really a thing there, uh, and then what they're like the more predominant framework that it's fun being functioned upon is this idea called ecological civilization mm -hmm. and it's very much like state led and it's kind of like this goal of like achieving a future where human and nature can live together and i would definitely say that there are a lot of great things happening because of that framework um, but i was just wondering like in your experience at oxford or just kind of like working with people from different parts of the world in general like how have you been able to kind of like learn from or kind of like address the potential difficulties of different frameworks um, that are more localized to like this person's own like situation, like country or parts of the world that they're coming from. Uh, and then the second part to that is also kind of like, again, I feel like in the international like environmental arena, like there's always this narrative about like how we uh, kind of like like global north countries always have a more of a say like at a table than global south country and i'm just wondering like how like have you seen any successful ways to not just highlight 
the climate disasters happening in global south, but also kind of like bringing in their local knowledge and epistemological frameworks to the conversation so we can like learn more about what exactly they're experiencing. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, which part do you want to start? I mean, I think that this, um, is, this is interesting about, you know, countries where there isn't a, an acceptance or a framework of, yeah. of climate justice and how to, how to move that needle. Yeah, so honestly, I see my role in, in those spaces as someone, um, you know, that's lived in the UK, that's been quite a, a, a lot of time in Kenya and planned to move there at some point in my life. Um, honestly, I feel like my role in those spaces is to be an active listener rather than someone, you know, educating people about things, just because, again, like the context is it's so different, even myself as, as a Kenyan American, because I didn't grow up in Kenya. I, when I am engaging with my friends that are involved in the Kenyan uh, climate, movement, I'm there as a listener. I'm trying to understand the dynamics that are, that are there um, to better inform how I understand the dynamics here and then also share knowledge. Um, so in regards to like being in the UK, I actually wasn't a part of a ton of organizing. I would show up to meetings and kind of be in the back, but I didn't really see myself as um, an outsider, as knowing that I would leave very soon um, as, as necessarily it being my place to to tell people um, or give give any type of advice that wasn't asked for, um, but in those in those circumstances, I personally learned a lot. I think, for instance, the the concept of children walking out of schools. What was so interesting is that I don't know if a lot of people noticed this, but there wasn't. A, with Fridays for Future being a global movement and in so many different countries, something that people weren't always making the connection with was that a lot of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa weren't participating in the walk out from school. And why is this? Because the right to an education isn't a right. Right, um, a lot of people don't have access to, to middle school, high school, let alone college. Um, so climate activism there for the youth demographic just looks different. The possibilities are different. The possibilities are different in Egypt when, you know, COP last year of folks having to really reconsider what does it look like to be a climate activist where I where someone could be arrested for taking for, you know, criticizing being a part of a demonstration. So I think there is, this is a, the power of having a global movement is being able to learn from others and share, um, share different expertise and really just do what we can uh, to, to, to support each other. And for the second question, what was the second question? local knowledge that is more suitable to talk about like the specific environmental or climate issues in that area? Yeah, I think this comes with just platforming those things. Yeah. Um, you know, we have solution-based journalism, which is journalism that embeds solutions mm -hmm. within uh, storytelling. And I think it's so helpful to do that, to not just provide people with with the, the negatives of what's going on, but to provide an accurate depiction of our world circumstance, which are tons of people across the globe that are not passive recipients of these dynamics, but are also a part of the solutions. And I think having more instances of platforming and highlighting those stories gives people, uh, allows people to have more optimism around these issues because I think it's much easier for us to want to join a movement when we know there's tons of other people doing the thing and doing many things and that makes it a lot less scary. It's this terribly trite expression but you know, think globally but act locally. Right. Um, you know, we have UN sustainability development goals that can give us the broader global framework but you know, that, that dialogue is about solutioning locally and solving the, um, the civil problems or civic problems, and, but threading through how they, how they all relate. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to bring our conversation to a close at this point, and um, I'm going to share with you one other comment that came in um, during registration. Um, didn't, it wasn't a question, so I didn't use it earlier, but it says, um, thank you for living your truth and sharing your experience. Thank you for caring for our planet and the black diaspora community. Your ancestors are with you and you inspire me. Um, and I'd like to just offer you an opportunity to 
leave us some closing thoughts. You can respond to that or, or just, just leave us with some closing thoughts for the work ahead. Honestly, that means so much to me. Um, I, I believe that I carry my ancestors um, with me everywhere I go. And I think about you know my grandmother who recently passed just a couple months ago and so much of what you know, I learned from her and her life is what I carry today. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'd say as closing words is that we need to practice revolution. You know, mm -hmm. you do the climate Venn diagram activity, uh, move past apathy, move towards climate action, and really begin to understand the climate crisis as, a, as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. We have this once in a species long opportunity to transform our world and, 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 and actively, yeah, love a, love a, love a better world world into existence and there is so much beauty in that and there's so much that we can learn specifically from artists from abolitionists um, there's that um, quote by Tony Bambara that says um, the role of the artist is to make the movement irresistible and we think about the climate crisis as having a narrative crisis and we're like what tools are we missing from our climate toolbox it is the tools of the artist. We think about science fiction and the way that writers are so skilled at being able to build worlds and entire ecosystems. And that's what we need in this movement. We need to give ourselves the space and really gain the tools of world building, of radical imagination, and allow us to, to fall in love with the possibilities that, that, that comes with a just climate future. Um, Wawa, well, thank you so much for sharing all of your journey and thoughts with us. Um, please join me in thanking our guest for her uh, thoughts this evening. <laughs>